Lisa Foxer, she has published widely um, on post-colonial subjects, maybe as, uh, her range of course immense, as you will know, and it also extends into fiction, as I'm sure you come across uh, some interesting work uh, And I leave you at this short introduction, if that's okay with you, thank you. Absolutely. And hand over to you uh, and to the panel. Thank you for doing that. This says, Yep. So I, I need to speak into this. Thank you very much, Klaus. I wasn't expecting an introduction at all. I'm here merely to, to facilitate this, um, this final session. Um, I should emphasize from the beginning that, we're, that um, Catch and AFTA are not um, you know, going to present, as it were, full papers. Um, they're going to offer some short comments and reflections on what they've heard um, at this incredibly stimulating conference and perhaps I should just begin by expressing on, on our joint behalf um, our great appreciation to Klaus Stierstoffer and his amazing team here at Münster who've put together I mean, such a vibrant and, and fantastically stimulating conference. I've really um, benefited from it um, intellectually, theoretically, um, gustatorily, <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of body comfort. So um, thanks so much. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll express that with our hands at the end. So, um, what I'm going to do, maybe I'll just take the speakers if you allow me in alphabetical order, so Avta first and, and Catch second, and uh, just hand over to them for their comments and um, possibly add a few um, of my own, um, depending on time, and then we're open to you, the audience, because this is very much a chance for people to continue some of the discussions that you've been having in the panel sessions but also the discussions, importantly, that we've seen on the walls downstairs in the form of the posters, um, where I noticed that in poster after poster, a number of sort of key words has kept coming up. Um, home, belonging, of course, displacement, imagined community, nation, transnation, transnational, borders, um, shifting borders, fractal borders, and so on. So, um, after that opening then, um, I hand over to Avtar Bra, who's on our advisory board, and we're so lucky to have her. Um, she's the Emeritus, or Emerita, is it? Emerita, Professor, um, uh, Anne Emerita Professor at Birkbeck. Uh, she was formerly in the Faculty of Continuing Education there, and of course her work on gender and diaspora is path-breaking and very, very important for our thinking. So, after I hand over to you. Thank you, Alekhe. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I hope you can still bear up for the next uh, hour or so. I think we're all tired, but uh, we've all been very energized by an excellent conference. Uh, and I totally agree with Alekhe that it's been very, very stimulating. Um, what I want to do is rather than reflect on the conference to begin with, I just want to say um, a few words about sort of just my little take on, on home uh, and belonging. The current local, national and transnational migrations are creating new displacements all over the world. The conditions which initiate the conditions that gave rise to the Astra, economic labor for instance, political conflicts and wars giving rise to refugee and asylum seekers, natural disasters such as famine, forcing people to move and so on, are as rife today as before. So in some senses, obviously, the 21st century is going to continue with the problematics that forced, faced us in the previous century. But they are obviously going to take a, a, a new form in, in the kind of political and economic conjecture that we face today. As this conference has highlighted, questions of home and belonging acquire critical importance in the Afghans. Home is where you are from, but it is also what you move towards socially, politically and psychically. It is not a fixed node, but a moving signifier, constructed and transformed in and through social practices, cultural imaginaries, 
historical memories and our deepest intimacies. The concepts of home and diaspora are intrinsically interconnected. As I have argued elsewhere, home and diaspora as theoretical concepts are better understood as historically contingent genealogies. Hence, they serve as investigative technologies that address their historical trajectories across fields of social relations, subjectivity, and identity. The concept of home, as mobilized in my concept of diaspora space, is a critique of fixed origins, while taking on board the concept of homing desire, which is indistinct from the concept of homeland. This is important because not all diaspora sustain an ideology of return, while all groups are affected by the affect, emotion, and memory inscribed within homing desire. Importantly, home is a political category. Wars are fought over it and debates over it engage our deepest emotions. Home raises the contradictions of the indigene subject position. It is a position which is on the one hand mobilized by right-wing groups, such as the right-wing British National Party, and on the other it is raised by First Nation peoples, such as the Aboriginal peoples of the world. What position we take in relation to such discourses and debates is a question of politics, which focuses on the power dynamics that inscribe indigeneity. The BNP is a racist organization where the First Nation people are dispossessed groups. Yet some of the arguments are sometimes similar, and in the case of the BNP, for instance, their views can appeal to what Gramsci calls the everyday common sense of the people. With all its contradictions, common sense is critically embedded in our deepest emotions about home. Hence, when taken to extremes, seemingly patriotic discourses can lead to all manner of severe conflict. The problematic that faces us is the question of origins, is whether the question of origins is treated in essential terms or conceived as a historical genealogy. The nature of the power relations is crucial. In home and travel, we carry different images of what we construct as home. The memories are deeply personal, but they are also structured by social relations, constructed around social differentiations, such as around such factors as social class, gender, age, sexuality, and so on. Feminists have argued that these are all intersecting modalities and these intersecting realities should be taken around account of in thinking about home. Where, for instance, we have different memories marked by the patriarchal cultural formations of which they are a part. The new context in which they may find themselves may offer them more options or provide greater restrictions compared to those at home. Similarly, if you are gay, your experiences are likely to be marked by the cultural views about homosexuality as well as the state policies and practices about issues of sexuality. Class position or economic situation is crucial to formations of home in both the country of origin and that of destination. Therefore, discourses of home and diaspora foreground the context of location and the regimes of power which produce these contexts. Home, whether in the sense of a nation, a transnational belonging, or a residence, is site of intersectionality, of contradictory realities, or experience. For example, home can simultaneously be a place of safety and terror a site of security and insecurity. Abused children, for instance, know this all too well. In my writing, I have described the astral space as a site where genealogies of dispersal intersect and interact with those of staying put. And I know Homi Baba was talking about his current preoccupation with staying put or actually living uh, side by side on settlement. And I think that both staying put on um, settlement as well as mobilities, I think we need to focus on both those um, aspects. Home is the node where genealogical intersection takes place. 
In a in business session in London and other major corporations, we have significantly large multi ethnic populations where different waves of migration have resulted in different populations making homes. These processes of homemaking have been rapidly contested, partly because of racism and economic discrimination. Even those who came as economic migrants to London in the Second World War period are sometimes known to display displeasure at subsequent migrations, say those of refugees. Immigrants who settled in post-war period may not regard those who hurt them as having a right to make a home in Britain, even though they themselves were newcomers not that long ago. In this racialized imagination, the memory of their own once migrant status is forgotten, as the newcomer is seen as other. Once racialized discourses hold sway, even the racialized can themselves racialize another. But the story of making has many positive dimensions. People speak of all manner of acts of kindness, of friendships and intimacies, of networks of support and formations of familiarity which make the place a truly form. And there lies hope for optimism. And I, I know we've been to, to, talking about the future of diaspora studies and I feel that the, uh, the range and the thoughtful papers that we have listened to, very stimulating papers, I think would suggest that the future for diaspora studies is very good indeed. Um, and, and I have really enjoyed listening to all the papers that have been presented. I think I'll stop here and then maybe come back later on. Thank you so much, Avatar, for those reflections on home in particular. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Kachik Toloyan, who is um, Professor of Letters uh, in the College of Letters in Wesleyan University and also a valued member of our COHAB Advisory Board. Thank you. There is a an item that I tried to fit into the notes I made for this, uh, and I just couldn't. So I'm just going to say it out detached. There is a novel, a science fiction novel, in which the word diaspora occurs frequently, where the future is a time of such achievement that humans don't need bodies. So they have biological bodies, but there's also their spirit, their intangible which most of the time leaves the body. So they, leave, so they live lives of wandering around in the universe as detached consciousnesses. Once in a while they come back to the body. The majority opinion is that only weak people really need a body as a home in this diaspora fiction. I tried to remember the name of the author, I can't though I know where the book is, but it seems that we can push everything to an extreme when we make fictions and have a good time with it. And this is, this is such a thing. The whole notion of the body as home is accepted, then derided, and real freedom is true freedom from the body. It is not a Christian text, by the way. So, uh, thank you all, first of all, for presenting a very stimulating uh, set of talks. The problem with that is that it becomes difficult to summarize uh, those high variety of those talks. I do want to say that I noticed above all the emphasis on instability, contingency, provisionality, the processual nature of everything, the dislike of fixed identities, the affirmation of porous boundaries, the emphasis on the changing economy of affinity and affiliation, the critique of the fixed. Um, I'm a person who actually, as, as someone who writes about diasporas, has written about most of these things in one way or another, most of the time approvingly. I personally resist and I see signs of resistance to that emphasis of, on mobility that knows no boundaries. That is to say, I have become an advocate of what I call the logic of the sedentary, and I know I have at least one, one ally here uh, managing things together, but it, that is the overwhelming emphasis. Um, I wrote down the rest of what I'm going to say. We heard a remarkable variety of papers as well as questions and comments addressed to the authors. I can't <coughs> summarize in a coherent way the rich heterogeneity of what I heard in the past two days. 
But there were a few issues, topics, threads of analysis and concern that emerged in several panel sessions. Some of them are bound to be important to the future of diaspora studies, and so in the few minutes I have, I'd like to sketch out a couple of them. One such topic has to do with the relationship between dispersion and diaspora. Both can be characterized by mobility, but achieved diasporas can also be localized, stable, sedentary, sometimes for several generations, at others for centuries. The Jews of medieval Spain, the Greeks of Alexandria, the Armenians of Istanbul, the Indians of the Caribbean, the Chinese of Thailand, the Africans of the Americas, constituted diasporas that differ greatly from each other, but all of them remained in place and, though they changed, they changed in place for long periods. I hope one doesn't think of remaining in the same place as being mired in no change. <laughs> remaining in place is not necessarily stagnation. Dispersion, on the other hand, comes before the diasporic social system emerges or after it is destroyed. At this conference, I was induced to think harder about pre-diasporic stages of dispersion, about mobility and confinement together. The very first panel I attended, the very first speaker, Francesco Bodarini, described a camp, that camp that's built in Spanish territory but on the shore of North Africa, where Africans and South, America, South Asian immigrants, or migrants rather, headed for Europe, are stranded for whatever reason. There they live, side by side, as the expression has gone, sometimes for a few months, sometimes for a few years. Uh, Bodalini's account reminded me of the now classic studies like Lisa Malki's and of many other accounts of refugee camps, especially the ones in Uganda that I've been reading for 20 years now. Together, this thread this, uh, confirms for me the importance of studying what I will call pre-diasporic spaces, for lack of a better term. Those pre-diasporic spaces emerge in refugee camp society, in refugee camps where there's a kind of society, I think, I think is important, or transit camp society, displaced person camp society, you name it, we've had all their ugly varieties since World War II, the displaced person camps, often here in Germany. I seem to know half a dozen Armenians who were displaced persons in Stuttgart camp before they shipped off to America. Of course, I'm not sure that the terms society and home what they can mean in such enclaves of confinement, of highly regulated mobility. I don't even know if there are social formations in those camps, or if there's a suspension of sociality in a space where instead the anxious individualism of desperate migrants may dominate. That is, you hear different things. Most of my knowledge of these camps comes not from my visiting them. I haven't been to one in a long time. I've had students who've grown up and gone and worked. I seem to breed students that go to work in camps. So it's all <laughs> feedback. Um, in her novel Jasmine, Bharati Mukherjee briefly imagines the camp in Cambodia where the Vietnamese boy Du survives for a while before moving on. It's a, an intriguing portrait, one of the more intriguing parts of that book for me. Uh, but I feel that I don't know enough texts in which that experience is I represented and reimagined. I'd love to know, as somebody who also works in literature, just how much fictional representation of such situations there is, situations of pre-diasporic spaces and camps, and then to study them alongside not only each other, but alongside social science reports, reading each, each of them with or against the other. I'm just going to go through a couple of topics. That's it. A second topic about which I speak and write hesitantly, even uneasily, is that of home. This conference has made me even more aware of how, how many pitfalls there are to the cognitive and emotional work that we do with the term. Home is not only an elusive notion for diasporic people and diaspora scholars. It is, I feel, increasingly problematic even for people who remain, who continue to live in their national territory. In teaching a class on, on diasporas, I ask my students now every semester, just literally the first class, each person goes around and says their names, then I say, okay, I want each of you now to say where your home is. The resistance to saying that 
is a mess. In one class, 16 students, 15 students refused. They basically said, well, if you mean where my parents live, it's there. Well, if you mean where I was born, it's there. But I would say, do you claim, do you own a home? Silence. <laughs> the one person who answered said very emphatically, Brooklyn. <laughs> Not Manhattan, Brooklyn. Um, so what I'm saying is that it seems to me home is now becoming so problematic for, diaspora, for, for even uh, indigenous, if I may borrow, after our term for a second to affirm that it complicates the way we think about diaspora because so much of what we has been written and said about diasporic home has counted on the notion that the national home is fixed and clear for everyone. I'm not sure anymore that that is so. I mean, of course, there are millions of people who are perfectly happy to stay where they are, but there are millions of others who are more and more uneasy about it. Um, this notion of the national territory as no longer feeling like a home, I think was most emphatically brought to my attention, most insistently brought to, if I may say brought home to me, by queer people. Uh, three years after the journal Diaspora began to be published, I received an article authored by a Chinese woman in Hong Kong, who, whose article argued that Hong Kong lesbians were a diaspora. They were living in the city where they were born and brought up, but they should be thought of as a diaspora. That is, that it was intellectually, analytically productive to think of them as a diaspora. She argued that um, at best the society tolerated their existence, that there were legal and social hostilities of various sorts that were inflicted on them, that lesbians were strangers in their own land, that they were a diaspora that had not been expelled, but had gone underground, but that the conditions in which they lived the, the, made them a diaspora. And there you have a side issue, which has been marvelously explored by certain scholars like Lily Cho, of, of whether diaspora is primarily a legal condition, a scholarly construct, or a subjective experience. That can you be diasporic merely on a claim of subjective experience? While I can't simply agree with that, I understand, um, I understand where they're coming from, as, as we used to say. I've heard forms of this argument, that is the argument of the lesbian author from Hong Kong who wrote about her own society, much more insist insistently over time. You, some of you may remember an event a few years ago in the United States, this horrific event where a young man who had just come out, I think he was not yet 17, was beaten to death and his body hung on barbed wire in Wyoming. Do you remember Matthew Shepard, I think was his name, right? Um, it, 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 it was very clear reading the newspaper reports afterwards that he was born in Wyoming. He never could feel remotely that he belonged in Wyoming and he was killed um, before he died. So I have a provisional, I, I mean as I was writing this, I just said provisionally what I can agree to as a definition of home is a place, a social setting where you can perform the identities you prefer safely. I'm not, I'm not going to commit myself to that, but for the moment that's, that's what I was led to by thinking about the things that were said here. It may be then that the most general definition of home I can offer is just that, a social space in which a person can enact, perform your preferred, her preferred identities without fear. Such a definition privileges the subjective. Home is where you feel at home, where you feel you belong. But this risks being a sentimental tautology unless it's supplemented by some kind of social science. Throughout the panel uh, sessions of our conference, I heard other definitions that were gestured at hastily, incompletely formulated. That is to say, home was ever present, but a definition of home to which the speaker was willing to cling was not aggressively put forward, which I, I can easily understand. This is not accusatory, but I'm just saying it was glancingly, incompletely formulated. Um, I think that that's because home, if it's going to be really defined, it needs to be a compound, composite term that accommodates all the features, all the subjective and socio-political, or if you like, bureaucratic, juridical elements that need to coexist in a fully adequate definition. If such a definition is possible, I suspect that its components will, uh, at best, remain in uneasy coexistence, but I'm going to take a shot at a couple of the elements that I think would have to be accommodated in such a definition. I truly have no idea how I would do it if I set out to do it. The most basic material notion of home, next to we are at home in our own bodies, 
Except, of course, we know enough about transgender to know that no, not everyone is at home in their own body, even. Um, they're the science fiction characters. Um, most basic material notion of home is that of a sheltering space whose door can be closed to shut out the world temporarily. We all have this experience. It's a gut visceral experience coming home on certain days, just being able to shut the door. And, you know, to, to have this space, this cave, this hut, this suburban villa is a need so basic that we avoid speaking of it. And therefore, I don't think I've ever thought through the implications of it. But I know that when I hear home, before I think of the warmth and presence of others, I think home is that space. The trajectory of refugees, migrants, and the conditions of pre-diasporic spaces, I think, require us to do so, starting with the most primitive but potent definition of home. Can there be something that a refugee can consider a home? I have read just enough memoirs of, say, the Russian Gulag, in which the description of space, since, of course, no one has a home, someone at best has a bunk, you can't actually possess the bunk because they move you from bunk to bunk. So there's that very notion that there's six foot by two foot that's yours for the 10 years you're sentenced to the camp, is not a lot, you're not allowed to commit even to that. So uh, I don't know how to turn these observations into something slightly more abstract so they fit into a definition, but I think if we're going to go at this notion of home, this is something that might need to be accommodated. The second indispensable element of the idea of home that I can think of, and here, if you'll permit me for a moment to be uh, biographical, um, my parents left Turkey with my father's passport taken away, so he had no, he was a sampatie, he was, uh, um, he, he lived and worked where he did by the, um, because government said, okay, you can have a work, a work permit, work here, and then you can be kicked out at any time, and we were, because my father was a combative, polemical sort of person. Uh, but but that, that it's, it's when you have something that can be instantly revoked. Your right to reside, never mind in a home, in a, in any, anywhere within the borders of a country, can be taken away. So the second indispensable element of the idea of home is citizenship, or its alternative, a set of basic rights that the right-bearing human subject can carry with her and that will be respected everywhere. We are, of course, a very long way from that. But something like that would be needed to, for me to feel at home, that, that you have the right to be in a certain way at any, any place. The third is a sense um, of home as constituted by parental and filial relations, which today Amitava Kumar evoked beautifully, powerfully. Home is where one was a child to one's parents and where one could be a parent to one's children. I, I feel, I, as he was reading, I felt the rightness of that once again. Um, and again, having been a, both a, a refugee and diaspora family, I, I think that, that's a very powerful thing for me as well. It may not be for you. I'm not, this is, there's nothing, what's the word, uh, this is not prescriptive, this is speculative, okay? Um, fourth, homes are made, especially diasporic homes, when narratives of arrival and settlement succeed in domesticating alien ground, and when practices of difference, of living differently, are tolerated by the dominant society and its laws. I think you need some kind of intersection or combination of the narrative and the practice of, uh, uh, in order to actually feel at home. Whether all these elements can be coherently brought together in a definition, I'm not certain. Fiction may be able, I suspect, to represent their coexistence better than social science whose need for clear boundaries and clear categories sometimes stops it from accommodating all of the kinds of different things that I've just mentioned. Uh, those were the things I'd written down. Other than that, I just want to men mention very much in passing, um, there were a number of people who talked in a variety of vocabularies, discourses, about what I would call the way in which diaspora re requires both the dissolution of old relationships with old places and the establishing of new relationships with new places. That, that's, that has to be almost, um, it's serial or linear in time, but eventually you experience it um, simultaneously. That is the memory of the dissolution of old relationships and with old places coexists with the actuality of establishing relationships in new places. Um, something that was mentioned relatively rarely, but because I've written about it and care about it, it's important to me to say that 
return was mentioned only a few times and return in its standard sense of can you return home? Can the exile go back and visit home? Can the diasporic go back? It, like the Germans in Canada who had money who could go back every six months. But for me return has been since my early writings also re hyphen turn because in that sense return becomes a metaphor for the various ways that you have of turning towards your homeland that don't include a geographical visit. You can return to the idea of the homeland through everything from media that you w w work with to activities like lobbying for your homeland, which is a common thing in America among more mobilized diasporas, to sending money home. For me, the remittances that people send to the homeland is a return. It's a turning towards it, sending something to it. It doesn't necessita necessitate a geographical uh, return. Um, Diasporas are founded on an experience of multi-locality. That is to say, even if, you're very, if, if I feel very much comfortable and at home in America, there are other places in the world where there are Armenians, some diasporic communities and some homelands that still matter to me. So it's an experience of multi-locality. You think about them, sometimes you live their pain, in many ways you try to help. Um, when, when Nils Fritcher was talking about uh, the ubiquity of the homeland, ubiquitous homelands, I wasn't sure what he meant, but I was very intrigued by it. And by the way, uh, I might steal that term if you don't publish it quickly. If you publish it quickly, I'll, I'll footnote it. <laughs> um, others talked, the, 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 the talks about Germans in Canada uh, were very suggestive to me in a certain way. Uh, Anke Patzel talked about how certain of the new Germans say, we don't need to participate in the community to continue to be or feel German. I think that is actually not just specific to there, but emergent in a number of the newest diasporas, the ones that are just developing in the last 10 or 15 years. I don't, I mean, to, to someone like my parents, it would have been unthinkable. What do you mean you don't need to participate? Being a diaspora means you, you, you participate, otherwise you're just a person, but you're not a diasporic person. I mean, they're very clear about the necessity. Sometimes they'd say contribute, sometimes they'd say participate, but to remain connected to others through formal means was important to a large number of those people who established all those diasporic institutions. It is rapidly becoming less so. Um, in the panel in which there were two papers on Iranian diaspora, um, Natalie Soleiman talked about how perceptions of homeland and also of the new home differ uh, depending on the wave of migration by which people came. I think that is also uh, a much more general. It's not just true of, of, of Iranians in Newcastle. It's, it's true of many, many diasporas of which I have some direct experience that the homeland doesn't mean one thing and, and the new diaspora doesn't mean one thing. A difference of 10 years in the time that you came can sometimes make a huge difference in perception and reaction. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catch, for a remarkably um, thoughtful um, set of reflections on, um, or dense and deep, really, set of reflections on, on home and belonging. Um, now it's time to wake up. <laughs> and um, if there are um, questions, comments, um, uh, thoughts, uh, quotes, even from the floor, um, you're very, very welcome either just to put them to the audience in general. Oh, thanks, Klaus, that's great. Um, and or, or to put them to one of the, the panelists and perhaps just take some of those definitions, very open-ended, enabling definitions that um, the two commentators have given forward. So, um, I, I open up to the audience. And while you're all pondering, um, I have one novel catch to put on your list, um, and that is J.M. Quitsey's most recent, The Childhood of Jesus, okay. which is, um, which is as some of you may know it in the audience, uh, which is a, is a, a novel about a child whose name is Jesus, mm -hmm. who, Jesus. Um, who who grows up in in a camp yeah. with with a father who's not his father, and he is. They are both um, both the 
surrogate father and the child in search of the boy's mother, whose identity um, and any memory of this woman they have completely lost. So they invent a family for the, for the child. In the front, please. Thank you. Do you know the next one? Yeah? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't finish thinking about it, so I'm just uh, talking while I'm just thinking about it. So what I really like was the difference when they said that hope has to be claimed on the one hand, and few people do it, or uh, in the, the situation of the seminar, but on the other hand, very often, what came through during the conference, the diaspora is something which is described to others. And there are spokespersons and some kinds of elites maybe who want to be spokespersons for a kind of diaspora. So, um, about this, this claiming home and about this new set of diaspora which is coming in now, somehow I thought that it's um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the small changes in the last 20 years, there were actually many countries which would not allow their persons to leave, which was different before also. So this whole idea of uh, claiming a home and being ascribed as a diaspora is something really new, I think, which you, which you point out, which you can, which you can see in comparison. So I thank you for that, uh, making me think about that, although it's not finished thinking. Just a, just a small point on when Trump was talking, I think I'm thinking not about belonging. I mean, these two concepts are always coupled, and yet we don't really give as much weight to belonging as we do to home. And what the juxtapositional correlation, if any, there is between them. I mean, belonging seems to be a much more abstract and subjective idea, and home, as you said, is like the door you close against the world or the lock that fits your key. Right. So I just it came away with that question mark in my mind that uh, although we use these terms as uh, sort of derivatives, um, we don't want to explore them. But don't, I mean, don't you think that there are degrees of radical non-belonging? That's why I mentioned the transgender in passing. I don't belong in this body. I don't belong in this family. Supposedly, psychoanalysts say that the number of people who at some point in their lives felt they were... Uh, but what's that? It's not lost children. There's a term, foundlings. They were foundlings. They, they don't belong with this family. It has a powerful sense. It's a fantasy, of course, but it's... So, yeah, I, I do think of... I think of home as having a necessary physical and social dimension, whereas the sense of belonging is the subjective one that usually coexists with it, but can be... You know, right. And also, I mean, there is something that I don't really have an inkling of how to write about. It's one of those things that frustrates me. And it's the way in which changing powerful discourses can alter individual sense of belonging. Powerful social discourses can actually alter individual senses of belonging. I think, again, the queer experience in the US in the last 30 years is going to provide the best example of that. It's just that I don't know that material well. I haven't studied it. But you can see how everything from changing public representations to the kind of language people have learned to speak, both queers and, and hetero, has actually changed the possibility for sense of belonging and feeling at home. I'm not so sure that belonging is purely subjective because I think that belonging is also inscribed in and through um, social and economic and political practices. So I think both home and belonging are kind of parallel. I, I mean, we, we, we've been talking about home, but I think, uh, as I, I said, home is also a place of terror. It's not always belonging. And I'm thinking on my, well, not on my feet, but on my seat. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it would seem that perhaps when you feel you belong, maybe that is when a place becomes home. Um, otherwise, you can shut the door to the world, but you might be beaten mm -hmm. by your partner at home, and you will not feel that you belong. So perhaps there's a relationship between belonging and home, 
which is actually quite a contextual one. When do you feel at home, at home, so to speak? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. There's um, a hand, uh, yes? The, that. <laughs> I mean, that was also, if, if I can add, an aspect I picked up, and it, it was something we have been discussing so very much. Is this word? The, 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 the negative aspects of um, home. Baba said in the interview I did with him at one point when we talked, uh, for him, still the most important definition of home was it's the place where you want to go back to. And of course, there's also the other side of it. It may be the place where you most desperately want to run away from. Uh, and so, you know, the diaspora becomes a blissful state. Um, and uh, I think most, most of the research which I've seen had a, a more positive side of, of you know, home is what you think of uh, as, as positive that you want to go to, back to. I can't recall, I'm afraid, the Philip Larkin poem, a wonderful poem about home and how you don't actually know it's home until you're away from it and you start thinking of it in a certain way. And yet, except for him, uh, going away meant going to Dublin on a visit. That's the occasion on which he wrote it. Uh, not, not that far from wherever he used to hang out. It's Northeast England, right? Uh, there is an American poem by Robert Frost, which is much quoted in this, in this context. It's uh, called, uh, help me out here, Amitabha, The Death of the Hired Hand, I think, yeah? And uh, so there's, the, the line that comes to mind is, home is where, if you have to go there, they have to take you in. <laughs> but you see, you have a song in this, uh, Kilos, would have been Christ. So yes. <laughs> the first uh, concept, I mean, it says, okay, no, for me it's Egypt, but what the heck? I mean, I have no, um, I didn't want to go back. Uh, it doesn't mean anything to me. It was my childhood, okay. It was not an unhappy childhood. It was just a normal childhood. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, he's not interested. The console brings him. He, he says, oh, okay. I just attributed that in the spirit of if we're going to discuss home, we have to admit competing notions of home. Yeah. Competing and ultimately irreconcilable ones, and then we have to pick the ones we that work for us. A, a, a class I had very similar to Catches, where we asked uh, around the group, um, where is home, um, produced a, a, quite a good definition to feed into this, home is where I leave my shoes at night. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a hand, yes, here, Amy, and then, oh, oh, oh sorry, I'm very sorry, yes. Thank you, just a second. Oh, of course. Um, as a session earlier today, somebody was talking about Freud's essay on the uncanny, and I wonder that we're talking about home both as it can be a very welcoming place to be and as it can be a constraint, and I wonder if thinking about the homely and the unhomely is two sides of the same coin is actually really productive so that you can have the canny and the uncanny. It's all part and parcel of home. Home is where you want to be maybe sometimes, but it's also maybe sometimes uh, a difficult place to be. Or it may even be a sign, you know, a place where your relatives are going to get revenge. There's some wonderful line that you read about, you know, payback and payback. And if you 
just say that. But I wonder if that's true of the uncanny and uncanny only, not only, they're all part of the same thing. Although I've taught the uncanny essay several times, I'm not quick enough on my feet to be able to respond to that, except to say that there is, of course, the Sandman and the sinister element. And someone who spoke before spoke of the sinister element of belonging. And that reminds me of what social scientists are always telling me, which is, well, you know, if you have a home that's your legitimate home, that usually means you're a citizen and there's a government, don't forget what Weber said. They have the monopoly on violence. That means two things. They can draft you to go kill other people and get killed. That's one part of what home means. We're protecting the homeland. Go, go kill and go die. And the other is, oh, you committed a crime. I think we'll take your life. So you can make home very sinister if you want by simply shifting the register in which you're talking about it. There's so many discourses of home. I suspect there's half a dozen that we don't even, none of us are remembering, but we will be reminded of. Perhaps the, the sure lay that we could just go through. <laughs> what else will leave somewhere that we consider home? I like it. Um, it's, it's just, I was just speaking of whatever the term generates in, the, in this context uh, now. If, if I may just this up for a moment, because I'm, uh, I, I think this is an interesting development. You know, it, it goes back, uncanny is, is the usual translation for Freud's unheimlich. And of course, in, in that original constellation, uh, it's, it's not two sides of the same coin, it's, it's the negation. You know, if, if you have an uncanny feeling, this is exactly the opposite of what you do when you feel home or homey. Home is safe. Home is not uncanny. Except you know, yeah. but then, but then now, yeah, but that, you know, that's the, that's the original. And, and then I see, as, as you suggest, this interesting intermingling in the use of the term home, homely and uncanny, that it begins to blur. You know, that, that clear separation is there in the song. So that, I, I think that's a very interesting uh, line of investigation. Sorry. No. Um, I really like Janet Dukey that you brought up the back in belonging and um, very often with these concepts such as this, so that like you say it's not very material, it's hard to pin down, I like to go back to the etymology. And so um, in the first day, um, very vice, um, and I apologize if I must have asked you me. Somewhere. Um, she was talking about land itself and that asked for literature and she said at one point there's this sense of I belong here and then the other side, and you can go either way, you can say either here belongs to me and have this legendary or here belongs with me and have the nobility. So how are, and then of course you can break it apart to be and longing and so how are these different ways that you can play with the actual word change your conceptualizing, that aspect, conceptualizing home. Thanks, Amy. Mm. Yeah. Um, just to go back to the question of the uncanny, my paper was actually on the uncanny in the context of the contemporary diaspora. And one thing I found very interesting and um, open to question in, in preparing my paper was that I very much felt that the question of the uncanny applied to contemporary diaspora, um, mainly in its temporal aspect, where the uncanny represents, so, as Freud puts it, something that has undergone repression and then emerged from it, and linking this in with the idea of diaspora, where there's a, there's a memory, diaspora and memory, where there's a memory of life before, then memory sort of drops out, and I particularly relate this to histories of slavery, slavery and post-colonial memory, and then memory returns. Uh, but I, I found it more difficult to relate the idea of the uncanny to um, contemporary diaspora when it comes to the idea of the strangeness that the uncanny encapsulates. So I, I wasn't sure whether that the homely and unhomely and that strange quality, whether that was something that necessarily conceptually linked in with contemporary diaspora, whether it was more of a sort of optional aspect of that whole relationship. But I'm, I'm glad to have the opportunity to um, discuss that further here because I didn't, I didn't feel that I was able to bring that to my um, discussion. Uh, can I just ask you, Avtar, and anybody else who wants to pitch in, 
You're quite right about, of course, home can be a quite dangerous place. I mean, I don't mean the home that's governed by the state, but also your own home. But isn't the notion that bad things can happen to you at home, that doesn't it already depend on the foundational necessary illusion that home is safe? That is, if the force of the terrible things that can happen to you at home is built on this kind of assumption that home is safe. I mean, the assumption is there, yes. Is there? The yeah. assumption is there, yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have in the reports quite a lot of anecdotal evidence that you have, you know, the warnings against be careful, avoid accidents with children, especially because those accidents happen at home. Ah. Right. Uh, so, <laughs> you think like you're <laughs> you die at home. You know, the most dangerous place is your bed. <laughs> American police, class American police officers are said to repeat that they would rather stop a robbery in the street than be called to a home dispute between husband and wife because people are crazier then and will do stupid things then. So. <laughs> I'm not inventing that, that's actually in reports about the police. Most accidents that happen at home, I like that. How much help? First of all, I want to add to your list about uh, what is home. A friend of mine, the writer said, home is where there is Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to establish that home. That's where you got your where the world wide web comes in. I think we should uh, do a little bit of justice to Ihab Hassan's magnificent paper. Mm -hmm. Because it was not, uh, uh, you know, I think we are sitting here for the list, and he defied all lists. He, in some ways, his paper actually captured the essence of an essayistic attempt. Do you know what it, it, it was essentially an essay on home? And therefore, it was a series of movements, sometimes contradictory, trying to seek draw some boundary with home, or belonging, and therefore I thought it was utterly, wonderfully instructive that it did not settle on one, but instead move from one to the other. And in the process, threw light on each of the states of seeking. Mm. And the wonderful element about language is, you know, starting with language, ending with language, finding in some of, um, some you know, in some syllables of hope, the future for that for the life. Yeah. Which, I thought, that continual attention to language, a way of thinking of that is housing his own uh, aspiration, his own sense of identity, and collective identity was also one of the I'm not mm -hmm. a great day, oh my god. And on me, performance of it, you know. <laughs> Can I just add a, a note that I, I, I very much agree? In, in terms of this conference, there was a lot of that paper that was sort of counterintuitive or that went against the grain in, in very, very interesting ways. I mean, that scene of leaving Port Said, never ever to return. So, no nostalgias of re return, no longing for the lost home, um, an openness to the future, which, which isn't always that which goes along with diaspora was, was really, really intriguing and, and thought-provoking. There is, in the current atmosphere of diaspora studies, there sometimes is um, an unwillingness to do what Ehab did, which is to say, well, can somebody remind me of the words at the end of Joyce's Portrait of the Artist, you know? To go out into exile, to forge oh, with cunning, with good cautious, exactly. Part of what he's expressing there is an exile, ju just like emigration, exile can be chosen because damn it, it's enabling. And that, that's an aspect of it that most of us, certainly someone who's moved, um, we understand that an exhilaration, that the feeling of what it enables, can coexist with regret. So you're, you're right in saying that he didn't settle on one, he moved from one to the other and shed light on all. Uh, it, it is, I, th I think in the United States, partly because people are writing 
very often scholars are writing really not as what used to be called an objective scholar, but as a kind of advocate of migrants who encounter sometimes, as we know, terrible conditions. So it's, they all talk as though the migrants are only in, caught up in those terrible conditions. And if you say, but you know, they know what the coyotes are like. They know what the crossing is like. They know how they can be abused. They keep coming. Could you give them enough agency to say, they know there's something they want badly enough that might be liberating enough, it might be enabling enough to come. Doesn't mean if you say that, you don't deplore the abuses to which migrants are subject. But the, there's a certain sanctimoniousness to the kind of advocacy that accompanies many scientific conferences. Because people feel that if they raise any of this, they're saying, well, the migrants aren't hurting. There's no, absolutely no reason to think that. Um, they're, they're hurting and they're coming anyway. It's, that tells you something. Thank you. Um, one more idea that came, I'm currently reading a book by an Israeli author called Neil Balaam. This, this book just came out in Hebrew, so I'm afraid that I doubt anyone else has read it. But probably it will be translated. And there's a moment there where one of the characters ponders about Odysseus, suggesting that actually he really didn't want to go back home to all that. I think fuffled is the right word, um, waiting for him back home. And I just thought that that is another homecoming that is not necessarily um, sort of. The Greek poet Nikos Kazantzakis, nominated five times for the Nobel Prize, never won. His uh, sort of most a manageable work is a 300-page poem which starts with Odysseus coming home and then almost immediately leaving. And what he wants to convey is not that he doesn't, that Penelope disappoints or anything else, it's just that homecoming for him necessitates, for reasons that we can't fully understand, the killing of all of the suitors. So it describes homecoming as a thick-set middle-aged warrior it says specifically, with hairy thighs where the hair is matted with the blood of the 40 people he's killed in essentially a dining room that's 30 by 30 feet. That's homecoming. <laughs> <laughs> But in the American campuses, homecoming is a... Uh, is great. <laughs> those of us who know it. <laughs> We've been following through a very rich thread of um, reflections and definitions and um, creative um, thoughts on home on home. Um, does anyone want to start another thread? We have a little bit of time. Um, don't feel inhibited in setting out on a new string of reflection. I I'd like to say something about, um, I mean, we were going to talk about um, the Aspra studies in the 21st century, mm. so you know, it would be interesting to hear from you what you think might be new about diaspora studies in this conjuncture as opposed to sort of, you know, previous periods. What I thought was, just to continue that, what, what I thought was um, was interesting from the point of view of somebody who is described here and there as a post-colonial critic was, um, is the relationship between post-colonial theory and diaspora theory or diaspora studies, they have seemed for um, a considerable time symbiotic, so concepts and ideas travel between and across the borderland between them if there is a borderland, if there is actually an overlap or, a, or an intersecting genealogy um, of theory. But I, I'd be interested to hear whether people here feel that there is now, that we can start talking about a body of diaspora theory that is actually sort of significantly divergent from post-colonial theory, given that, as Amitava was sort of, you know, provokingly and to me quite, um, you know, 
semi-convincingly saying that this morning, you know, there are no people in post-colonial theory. Well, surely there are people in diaspora studies. You know, they're, they're, it's all about people on the move, settling down, finding a home, not finding a home. Any, oh, I, I just throw that out as, as a question, whether, whether others perceived that rub or that divergence between post-colonial theory and diaspora theory. Post-colonial theory ke keeps coming up. I mean, we had the one of the triad of the originary post-colonial theorists, you know, opening the conference with his with his wonderful plenary yesterday morning. Feels like about a week ago, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yesterday morning. Um, you know, there he was in this conference that's on diaspora studies, really, in the in the in, in this 21st century. How can you not call someone named Homie to a conference? <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> <laughs> Homie who writes on homeliness. <laughs> I, I think there was a hand. Were, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, I guess I'm a mother. I guess we probably. <laughs> Um, thank you. I was just going to say, I like that you bring that up because a lot of times I feel like sometimes in the American academia, depending on where you are, there's a sense to pull this with past post colonialism. Um, and again, it depends on the context, but perhaps it, what would decide whether there is a parting of ways or still at a juncture of the two areas is what is the context of that diaspora? So for example, I work on the Indian diaspora. And so as long as Indian intellectuals and about the country, the people, the culture, even are struggling with post-colonialism, then I can't ignore that in my work. Because you carry these things just like you carry your baggage with you. So I would argue in that sense, until post-colonialism has been figured out for the people, whether they're leaving longingly or they're it's been nice, nice to meet you, goodbye. Mm. Um, you know, then they still carry it with them. So. Mm. Also, I suppose I mean, a, strong, a strong link is that, um, as Ihab Hassan was saying in, in, in his talk, um, colonialism, experiences of empire through home into question, you know, cre created displacement and, and dispossession and the, the breaking up of communities and, and therefore diasporic experience. Well. But catch and then Sorry, and then I, Klaus. I, Sorry, I'm being I'm being I, just, Madam just Chair a, here. Just a footnote to that: that colonial experience, when it when it elicited some of the most angry response, the response is formulated in terms of who are these people who have invaded our home? Not even our homeland, our home. So I, I mean, the, the, the displacement is formulated sometimes. I don't know enough of the languages of colonized countries to know, but in the one couple I know, it, it is, it's a home invasion is what it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Charles? I, I have this other, perhaps, uh, not entirely unrelated issue of disciplinarity. Uh, I mean, the course, we all sort of claim to say here that the uh, Chinese are not disciplinary in the field of research, but at the end of the day, we still work in the uh, field of research. And I think that this is the sort of 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 the
Um, Klaus Alter has a response. No, I, 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 my, my impression was quite the opposite actually. Um, I just looking at the papers that have been given here, uh, majority of them have been in literary studies. And, and I think there's a lot of work going on mm -hmm. in terms of diasporic literatures. Um, so I'm not so sure about that. Be because... After I was talking about um, all this sort of theoretical stuff, there's a sort of theorizing ah. that happens. Uh, I don't see, maybe I've been looking a lot, I don't see that so much happening on the literary side. Because I'd like to venture to say, Klaus, that stories are a way of writing ourselves into belonging. You know, so so literature is you know key. I'm not saying it's not pertinent. No, no, I, I, I yeah. If, if, if I might, um, I mentioned it today. I think in the same panel I mentioned earlier, um, Robert Young just uh, came out with an article in the recent PMA um, suggesting, pretty um, article, uh, suggesting, uh, suggesting that um, post-colonial writing is comparative, is inherently comparative. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, and I apologise. I don't know the article here. But suggesting, um, which I think is a very interesting idea, that post-colonial literature is inherently comparative. Because, you know, um, so I come from comparative literature, so apologies for uh, an obvious agenda here. Um, but this idea of comparative literature, what is comparative literature, so in a sense suggesting that post-colonial literature, or literature that is written through post-colonialism, um, is comparative. So I think, um, and there's another article on the same issue by um, Danosh, also addressing similar issues. So I think that what I'm trying to say is that uh, I think that what you are articulating this need is being, um, as we speak, addressed because there is a deep need for this, um, this theoretical um, um, corpus. And um, so I think it's, it's been. I'm sorry to come up there. I mean, just saying, my remark was, was, was maybe sort of anecdotally statistical, uh, you know, that the sort of bibliographies we amass, we just find, perhaps happen to find, fewer work coming out of the sort of core literary studies uh, field than for all the other disciplines we deal with. Maybe that's, if you've refuted it. <laughs> I think that it has been noted by uh, at least Danish and Lerner, um, and they just now, I just got these few um, just now. Um. I mean, the, the, the novel, the, the novel is itself a mode of analysis. Yeah. <laughs> Woo -hoo! Um, okay. I, w w I'm feeling that. Um, we probably need to close down. We've had some great discussion and a wonderful exchange of images and ideas in this final plenary session. Um, it remains for me to, first of all, thank the two plenary panelists who've offered such great and productive comments. And then, and I would, if I may, take the liberty, like you, you guys over there, you tr triad, to stand up, please. Um, so, and just for us to thank Annika, Marlena, Florian, and Klaus. Thank you very much and go well all of you to your homes, <laughs> your places of belonging. We're going to leave, of course, to say thank you so much and look forward to sharing this time with us.